Good morning, everyone. This is the California State Library uh, here to present to you information about the upcoming California Library Literacy Services Year. So we will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. If you have questions, feel free to put them in chat or you can save them and present them uh, over audio or video at the end of the presentation. But we're, we're just recording the presentation and we wanna have a clean presentation. So um, welcome. And today is the webinar or the information session on preparing for the new CLLS year. We will cover a review of what you have to do for the, the past year in reporting, um, but we're really talking about the new fiscal year that began July 1st, 2024. So this is for programs who are funded in 2024, 2025. We're your CLLS team at the State Library. I'm Bev Schwartzberg, Library Programs Consultant, and these are my colleagues, Allison Gifredo, the Literacy and Grants Analyst, and Lisa Lindsay, Grants Analyst, and we are your CLLS team. All right, so today we're going to cover a quick welcome. Welcome, everyone. We haven't seen you all together in a couple months like this, so it's good to have you. And then um, we're going to, as Bev mentioned, really quick um, look back at 23-24's remaining activities, then move into what the um, this presentation is really focusing on, the 24-25 timeline of activities, um, changes to spending, um, data collection changes, and then some additional support and resources that can help you um, navigate these changes that are going to take place um, and that are in effect now as of July 1st. And then we'll um, dedicate the re remaining time of this session to questions and answers. So feel free to drop those in the chat or hang on to them, and we'll come back to them later on. So 2324 remaining activities. As you um, may have seen, uh, our 42324, the final day of the program period was June 30th, 2024. Um, just as a quick heads up, August 1st, the CLLS 2324 final report is scheduled to open. Uh, September 30th, uh, 23 or of 2024, um, the CLS final report is due. And then between October to November of this year, we'll do the final report review period uh, where you will uh, may possibly receive comments and questions about your submitted report. And then once all of the reports have been uh, reviewed and approved, you'll receive a certification form via DocuSign to officially close out the year. And then um, for this year, December 31st is the final day to fully expend your 23-24 encumbered funds and an approved encumbrance request should be on file in order for you to encumber those funds. So I think that's the challenging part about CLLS is that we're always um, either looking back or looking forward. And I think that can be pretty challenging. So we just wanted to do a quick reminder of remaining activities for 23-24 because even though the program period ended, there's a few final activities that you will have to manage until the final reports do or your encumbered funds are completed. I'll pass it to Lisa. All right. And just um, a reminder, July 1st, the new period began. Um, award packets, we're working on that right now. You should be getting those in the next month or so. Um, CLS will be transitioning to a new grants management system called Amplifon. So instead of counting opinions starting in January, you'll be inputting your data into um, the new system and we'll have more on that as um, the year comes on. And then um, February, 2025 is when mid-year reports will be reviewed. And then after that is when the certification and claims occur. April, 2025, um, the applications for the following year will be open. And then the last thing I just want to highlight on here is um, September 2025 is when the CLS final reports will be due for this current programming year. So everything that we're going to cover right now is stuff that will impact that report that you'll be doing a year from now. But of course, you need to know um, what you'll be reporting on come um, September 2025. So that is why we're here. 
Um, and just a couple of reminders on changes to spending before we jump into the reporting changes. So CLS funds and local matching funds cannot be used for the following. Promotional items like pens, pencils, notebooks, et cetera, at outreach events. So anything that like the reason the person is interacting with you is to have you give them the thing, we don't want that. So that kind of outreach, you cannot use um, the funds for. So those are still okay for enrolled learners because of course the enrolled learner or the tutors are interacting with you because of the reason that they're there, not because they want the free pen. So you, same, same light on um, giveaways like learning kits or bags during outreach events are also not allowed. You can't purchase furniture except under indirect expenses and um, indirect expense cannot exceed 10%. And then um, funds can't be used for parking fees or transit passes and they cannot be used to pay for general library operations cost recovery. So those are things you can, um, of course, provide, just don't include it in any of your reporting. So we don't need you to tell us about it. And these are just things that come up as a result of, you know, as, as questions happen, as we realize, you know, this hasn't been navigated before we get answers. And so these are things that are changes as of um, the year ahead. And I am going to pass it to, is that Beth? Yeah, that's me. All so right. there will be some uh, changes in the data you collect for this current, the fiscal year that began July 1st, 2024. Um, we're announcing these to you as soon as we can, but these are the areas that have changed. One is the new budget categories, and you're familiar with that. Two will be some details about learner demographics. Three will be some details about your CLLS programs. Four will be some details about volunteers. Five will be some details about outreach activities. And six will be some details about roles and goals. And we're going to cover these individually. New budget categories. And this is familiar because you use these budget categories in your application. Uh, these are the categories that you use to complete your application and that you will use for reporting for the coming year, not for the past year. I mean, we, you're going to complete that reporting in, in August and September, but for the coming year, the categories uh, align with the LSTA grant categories, and they are salary, wages, and benefits, consultant fees, travel, supplies and materials, equipment $5,000 and more for which you must obtain permission uh, before uh, spending, services, which is a very large category, and then indirect, which is up to 10% of the rest of your budget. For learner demographics, um, we are combining some categories. We are following the new census guidelines, but also California state law for state-funded programs. Um, but these categories are now combined, but must be collected separately for adult literacy and ESL learners because the ESL funding is a separate funding stream. So you see these categories, they're going to be familiar, but some of them are new. Hispanic or Latino used to be a ethnicity category. It is now in the general demographics category. So there's American Indian, Alaska Native, uh, a bunch of uh, categories that they used to be known long ago as Asian that are now broken down according to California state law. The same thing's true for Pacific Islanders. And then there's Black or African American, Hispanic or Latino, Middle Eastern or North African, and that's a new category, um, white, other, or prefer not to say. Other learner demographic categories have not changed and must be collected separately for your adult literacy program and your ESL learners. Uh, those are age categories. We do ask the age of all learners. This is something we do report to the legislature. Gender categories, prior education categories. And that, you'll remember, we in, uh, created that about two years ago. It is mandatory. You must report prior education for all learners. It's not optional. It's mandatory. Uh, and we do ask for ESL learners. You must report learners' primary language or home language. So I think this is the section that is most different to 424-25. And as like a larger view, the goal of the state library it has been to 
standardize um, some of our um, grant programs that have been a little different, which includes the LLS. And we ha have been, to do that, we've uh, changed the budget categories to uh, match the standard budget categories. And another aspect is this element, um, how we're collecting um, adult literacy and ESL and family literacy activity information. And so, um, I should have put a slide, but um, we'll cover like each of those um, programs, one-on-one, -on -one, small group and large classes and walk-in tutoring. And so for one-on-one -on -one tutoring, um, you'll be collecting the following information separately for adult literacy and ESL learners. Um, the format of your one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions, are they in-person, are they virtual, or do you offer them in a combination of in-person or virtual settings? Um, what is the average length in hours of your one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions? Um, so how long are people meeting for on average for the program period? And then um, how, the number of one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions. So how many times did each of your one-on-one -on -one tutoring pairs meet for the year? And again, these must be collected, this information must be collected separately for adult literacy and ESL. And so a big change is that we're going to start collecting small group and large class information together um, for adult literacy and ESL. And similarly, we're going to collect the format of small group and large classes. Are they in person? Are they virtual? Or are they a combination of in person or virtual? the length of your small group and large classes. So this is like the average length again in hours. Um, what, how, about how long are each of your sessions that you offer throughout the year? Um, the number of small group and large class sessions. So how many times did you offer a small group and large class session um, in the year? and the average number of att in attendance for each of your sessions for the year. So how many people attended on average each of your small group and large class sessions? And then this is also um, new. So the third program we'll be collecting information for is walk-in tutoring for adult literacy and ESL separately. And what we're collecting for walk-in tutoring is the format, again, in-person, virtual, or a combination of in-person or virtual. Um, the total number of walk-in tutoring sessions, so in the year, so how many uh, walk-in tutoring sessions did you offer throughout the whole year, and the average number of walk-in tutoring sessions per month. And so how many um, sessions did you hold each month on average? Um, family literacy activity information. So family literacy, we're still going to collect um, information for enrolled and eligible but not enrolled uh, learners separately. But you will be able to col uh, report information for one-on-one -on -one tutoring, um, one -on -one tutoring now. Again, we have a format, and I see a question in the chat that we'll answer later. Um, so the format of your one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions for um, enrolled and then separately for eligible but not in yet yeah, enrolled learners is it in person virtual or a combination um, I think quite a few programs are still offering combinations so if you're doing both you'll answer combination uh, the average length in hours of your one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions for your enrolled or eligible but not yet enrolled lear adult learner families and then the number of one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions. So how many of these did you hold in the year? How many times did your uh, family adult learners meet um, and one-on-one -on -one in the year? We'll do that combined number. And then what we're um, also going to collect small group or large class information together um, for uh, those enrolled learners, and then separately for eligible but not yet enrolled learners. So the format again, in-person, virtual, or a combination, in-person or virtual, um, the length of your small group and large class session. So this is the average length in hours. The number of small group and large class sessions, um, did, how many of those did you hold throughout the year? 
and then the average number in attendance per small group and large class session. So about how many people joined your sessions on average throughout the year. All right, and now I'm gonna cover volunteer information. The um, changes for volunteer um, is hopefully gonna make things a little bit easier. Um, we're not going to collect data on the demographics for volunteers anymore. So if you still collect it, you're welcome to do what makes sense for you, but you will not need to report that to us. And then additionally, volunteer data has been simplified. Specifically, we'll need the number of individuals who served as a volunteer, the number of volunteer hours, and that's both instruction and non-instruction, so you can include um, training time, the length and hours of basic tutor training, the number of times basic tutor training was offered, and then a yes or no, did you offer continuing education for tutors? Bev, you're on mute. Yep, I got it. So for outreach information, we are now collecting outreach information in a different way. It will be collected for adult literacy, for family literacy, if applicable, and for ESL services, if applicable. Um, these are the types of outreach events and not limited to this, but some examples of outreach attends, uh, events that you might report that you attend to engage the community in literacy services. These may include things like community fairs, festivals, school districts or other uh, human service agencies, literacy events, back to school nights, parent councils, workforce development events, health and human services events, jail, prison, uh, reporting center, and other. So for the outreach information, we will be collecting the number of outreach events you attended during the reporting period. So that's collected for the full year, 2024-25. The number of individuals you contacted through outreach. For libraries with family literacy programs, the number of books to build home libraries provided at outreach events for eligible families. We'll keep, we'll, we love reporting that number of books and also the types of benefits that your program sees from outreach efforts. Did you enroll new learners? Did you recruit volunteers? Did you receive money or in-kind support? Did you form or strengthen a community connection? Thank you. So roles and goals um, has undergone some slight changes this year. The goal categories have been simplified from 32 goals to 21 goals. Hopefully you might see that some of those goals that may have been duplicated, um, like the job related goals have now been combined. Uh, we have some, we've added some ESL related goals and we've added an other option um, for each role. So you will continue reporting roles and goals per learner in the following categories, the number of adult learners and ESL learners who set at least one goal during the reporting period, the number of adult learners and ESL learners who made progress towards at least one goal in the reporting period, and the number of adult learners and ESL learners who met at least one goal during the reporting period. And again, um, a, a learner, um, oh, we'll talk about it in just a second, actually. Uh, so you also will be reporting the number of adult and ESL learners who set, made progress toward, and met each goal. And so the goals um, are now look like lifelong learner, learn the alphabet letters or sounds, read a book, magazine, or news, the news, write a letter, poem, story, or essay, use technology skills, use the library, get a diploma, improve communication skills. So that's one um, to... Uh, that we've added for ESL specifically, and then other. So um, we are asking folks to only use the other category um, to write in a specific goal if the goal cannot be connected to another goal listed above. Um, so you, um, we're asking you to map um, each goal, uh, your goals to a similar goal, if you can, um, in each role category, and only using the other category if there's a, if a goal cannot be mapped for uh, any reason. And if you come across this, we can always help you work through that too. Um, but that's uh, we're asking the other category only be used if something if a goal cannot be mapped to 
other goals already listed under that role. And so then we'll have in our worker role category, get a job or a better job, apply for a job, perform current their current job better, get a license or certificate for work. And then we have, again, that other category. So if you have a worker related role or goal, I'm sorry, um, you're going to, you can write in a specific goal if that goal cannot be connected to any of the four goals above. And family member goals. So read a book with a family member, help a family member with homework and studying, read a medicine label or other health-related documents, improve financial skills, build confidence speaking with or for my family, and then this other category where you're able to write in a specific goal if the goal cannot be mapped or connected to a goal listed above. And then our last role category, community member citizen, so access community resources such as um, WIC, Medi-Cal or Medicare, CalFresh or other services, get enrolled in the community such as volunteer at a community organization, school, place of worship or other places, uh, get a driver's license, become a citizen, vote, and then the other category where you're able to write in a specific goal if the goal cannot be connected to other goals listed above it for that role. Okay, and um, just a reminder, we do have two Q&A sessions on all of these changes, as well as um, links on our website. We'll be um, sharing out the video of the recording today if you need to share it with others. Um, and you're always welcome to schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Allison and I both have in our um, email signature a link to schedule a meeting, and those links are included on here as well. The rest of the time we have for questions, we do ask that you put them in the chat and we will have an easier time creating the Q&A that way.